Hello, I'm Bob Smirfak, but not really. This series is designed for theological seminary students with approaching exams who have not had time to read the Bible, and for fundamentalist action fans who would have felt safer if the Antichrist had come when Chuck Norris was still in his prime. Matthew chapter 27. Let's go. In this chapter, it appears that Caiaphas and his legal team had pulled an all-nighter with their impromptu trial of the J-Man, because all that action pretty much took them up until rooster time. And then in the morning, the religious chieftains and patriarchal honchos had a meeting about killing Jesus. So they tied him up and dragged him over to another really nice house, this one owned by the hot shit top Roman guy in the area, Pontius Pilate. Cut to Judas, newly anointed asshole of the millennium. He caught wind of the speedy conviction and death sentence and had a big paradigm shift. He took all his Jesus money back to the chieftains and the honchos. He said, um, I kind of screwed up here, fellas. Turns out that guy didn't do anything wrong. And they all said, so, that's your problem. So Judas did a big dramatic throwdown of all the coinage and made his departure. For reals. He scouted around and found a great place to commit suicide. Now, the religious chiefs picked up all the money and mulled over this delicate situation. They said, we can't just deposit this back into the church's savings account because it's basically the fee for a contract killing. But they came up with a political solution. They bought some real estate where people dug up clay to make cookware and turned it into a cemetery for dead folks who didn't have any identification. After that, it acquired a catchy nickname, the Field of Blood. And that whole thing checked off another box on the big list of Jeremiah prophecies, where he'd predicted that some people would buy up some pottery clay digging field with the 30 large, which was the amount tendered for a particular dude of whom the kids of Israel thought pretty highly. Meanwhile, in an alternate universe as described by a magic scroll called the Acts of the Fabulous Jesus Boys, Judas didn't kill himself or even return the Jesus money to the priesty boys. Instead, he made his own real estate purchase. But then he took a header and his stomach exploded, allowing his intestines to get all over everything. And that's why people started calling it the field of blood. But lest we fall to the temptation of believing these narratives are mutually exclusive, we turn to the mathematics of apologetics, beginning with the following simple formula. Judas throws down the blood money in Matthew, plus commits suicide in Matthew, plus his bowels explode from his rotting corpse in Acts, plus the priests buy land in Matthew via Judas's money in Acts, divided by Occam's razor equals Swiss cheese. However, if we raise our numerator to the power of rationalization, any underlying reason is overwhelmed, thus rendering the smell test effectively odorless, resulting in nothing to see here, please move along. And while this may be a dangerous stretch for non-believers, those whose beliefs have been bent backwards by years of following a conclusion to its evidence are in a state more than limber enough to withstand the necessary contortions. Anyway, these two conflicting accounts would be the subject of much discussion and stake burning until the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics made the argument moot. For now. Let's stay in Matthew world, in which the J-man was getting FaceTime with the local big man from Rome. Pilate hit him with a question. Are you the ruler of all the Jewish type people? Jesus kept it short. He replied, you said it. Then the church hoo-haws and the older guys threw all their accusations into the mix. But the J-man kept it even shorter. Crickets. No response. So the Roman governor checked in with him. Hello, are you getting all this? These are some pretty wild charges. But Jesus just gave him more crickets. And Pilate thought that was fascinating. Anyway, the Roman gov usually did a Passover bonus round for the people, where he'd let them pick someone to use a get-out-of-jail-free card. And currently, there was a pretty well-known hoodlum doing some time, named Barabbas. So Pilate seized on this opportunity and said, Hey, who gets out? What do you guys think? Barabbas or Jesus the Christ man? Because Pilate had it figured out. They were hating on Jesus because they were jealous. So when Pilate took a load off on his big chair to let them chew on that, his wife basically told him to punt. Jesus is a law-abiding dude, and I've been having uncomfortable dreams about the guy today. Two things. It's good to be the governor's wife because you get to nap all day. Also, this woman clearly had a lot of Jesus on her mind. But who can blame her? She was a bored, rich housewife without cable, and Jesus was the perfect man. At the same time, the hoo-hahs and elders were canvassing the crowd to tell them which way they should vote. Early release for Barabbas and death row for Jesus. So the governor popped the question, who's it going to be? Who gets to walk? 
The chief priest's campaigning had worked because the studio audience voted for Barabbas. But Pilate said, okay, but what am I going to do with this Christ fella? So the crowd suggested Jesus get the crucifixion special. Pilate said, whoa, whoa, hold on now. What exactly has this guy done wrong? But the crowd insisted, give him the business. By this time, Pilate was starting to get the idea. He was just a dude with a title and a nice house. This thing had a life of its own and was about to blow. So he scrounged up a bowl of water and washed up in front of everybody as a symbol of how he felt about the whole thing. Either that or he just had a greasy lunch. But he said, this guy is on the level and I am out of this. The rest of it is on you guys. But they didn't have a problem with that. They said, sure, you can blame us and our offspring. Some people give their kids a trust fund, or at least a graduation trip. These folks opted for the anti-Semitism plan. Let's give a bunch of ignorant assholes a bogus excuse to hate our descendants until the end of time. That's one way to go. So Pilate sprung Barabbas and had Jesus spanked really hard for good measure. Then he turned the poor guy over to the crucifixion team. One might suppose that if Pilate really wanted to be innocent of all this, he might have forbidden anyone to kill Jesus. After all, he's the guy in charge. On the other hand, there's no evidence that Pontius enjoyed being the prefect. He may have just been dying to give Judea the middle finger. Indeed, he, and presumably his Jesus-obsessed wife, packed up and split back to Rome four years later. That doesn't help the J-man right now, though, because the MPs hauled him into a big room and rounded up pretty much a whole garrison to participate in this next bit. They tore his clothes off and outfitted him in a red bathrobe. Then they made him wear a hat constructed of really prickly branches, handed him a stick, and got down on the ground in front of him. They said, give it up for the head honcho of the Jewish types. Then they sprayed him with some more saliva and then grabbed the stick and smacked him across the cranium. Harsh. But that was just the end of the floor show. They made him put back on his own clothes and carted him off to the main event. Caution. The remainder of this chapter contains graphic images of mutilation and public humiliation. Parents with small children are advised to mute this portion and read from other, more family-oriented Bible stories, such as Genesis chapter 6, Numbers chapter 31, or 1 Kings chapter 18. Enjoy, kids. The first thing the cross crew did was grab a dude off the street, a guy from Cyrene named Simon, to schlep the big unwieldy boards they were planning to use to give Jesus the nail up. If you're a Roman soldier, or a Jesus for that matter, this is a good thing. However, if you're a Simon of Cyrene, this may very well be a sizable imposition. Imagine you're minding your own business on your way across town, and the police order you to carry a couple of logs to the top of one of the highest hills in the city. That'll clear your afternoon calendar for you. Meantime, in the alternate universe described in the scroll to be written at a later date called John, Simon of Cyrene, if he even existed in this world, was off the hook and continued doing whatever he was doing. Jesus carried his own cross. This is great for a Simon and bad for a Jesus. God may have inspired the scrolls differently in this way in order to teach us that in any life scenario, someone always gets the shaft, or at least carries it. But once again, these parallel worlds of Matthew and John offer no contradiction if we employ the familiar additive gospel formula, Matthew plus John equals Jesus and Simon both carried the cross. Besides, in a post-truth world, do conflicting accounts really matter? When someone questions your facts, your talent for pivoting the argument down a blind alley is a much more valuable currency. Just FYI. Anyway, back in Matthew world, the whole entourage wound up at Golgotha, loosely translated Skull Mountain. The soldiers offered Jesus a beverage, sort of a wine spritzer, but the spritz was an additive called gall, which was basically an over-the-counter painkiller. So the J-man took a sip and was like, no thanks, I'm good. And that was the end of the line. I think we all know what comes next. A nasty fate almost as violent as a Mel Gibson movie. It's a douche move to pull on anyone, no matter how much you hate their guts. Especially if you're a Roman. You decided it was so gruesome that you've outlawed it as a method of execution for your own citizens, but you're happy to whip out a cross and nails for a foreigner? This kind of double standard wouldn't be exemplified again until Guantanamo Bay was opened up 2,000 years later, enough said. So the crucifixion is undeserving of any more attention. But we've come this far. So why not suss out a few details and see how squeamish we are? Yeah? Come on. Don't worry. Even though it kills him, he lives. It goes like this. First up, a brutal beating, likely with a bone or iron pellet-studded whip, causing deep cuts which often left you in shock due to blood loss. Next, 
a forced march to the execution spot, during which you usually had to carry the 100-pound crossbeam yourself. Then, they laid you down and drove thick 5-7-inch to seven inch iron spikes through your wrist bones into the crossbeam. These weren't exactly drywall nails. Finally, you get to hang out for a few hours or even days while you lift yourself up by your nailed arms for every breath until you just can't do it anymore. Then fluid fills your lungs and you asphyxiate. If you're lucky, someone will break your legs so you can't push up on your feet and you suffocate much faster. Anyway, after the crucifixion boys got the J-Man upright, they took a break and drew straws to see who got his threads. It was a good thing they did this, because that knocked over another prediction made by a psychic dude in a back issue of one of God's old magazines. Next, they plopped down on the ground and watched him for a while, with a sign above him that advertised him as the ruling monarch of all the Jewish types. Now, while they were at it, they awarded the same treatment to a pair of burglars they wanted to get rid of, and posted them on either side of Big J. Apparently, there were a few passers-by, and they shook their heads back and forth. They said, you're that church house destroying and rebuilding in three days guy. Rescue yourself. If you're actually the male offspring of the Sky Man, come on down from there. The top religious hoo-haws, the Xerox men, and the patriarchal types were there too, and they weren't exactly supportive. They said he was pretty good at making saving throws for other people, but now he can't roll his own saving throw. If he's really got messiah chops, let's see him pry himself off there, and then we'll sign up with the program. Or, he relied on the Sky Man. Let the Sky Man bail him out now, if he wants him. After all, they said, Jesus had claimed to have a father-son relationship with the Sky Man. But if that wasn't bad enough, he had to listen to the same whole spiel from the two kleptomaniacs posted adjacent to him. However... Over in the parallel universe of the Luke Scroll, that quantum superposition had collapsed in a slightly different direction. One thief gave him the trash talk, but the other one made an arguably smart play by asking Jesus to keep him in mind when the Heaven Initiative got rolled out. To which Jesus replied, You're going to Skytown with me today. Winning, of course, in the quantum world of Matthew. Neither of the burglars had had that bright idea, so... Losing. But this plot much like an underdone sauce, was not through thickening. At noon, right about the time you'd expect to have to look for shade, things got dark all over until three o'clock. We're not privy to God's method of dimming the lights for such an extended period. Perhaps a cloud cover of epic density. Perhaps a large object placed between the earth and the sun. Or even a solar circuit breaker. Regardless, three hours later, the bizarre outage was over and the J-Man offered up a few words in syro chaldaic to the tune of, Earth to heaven, come in heaven. Why are we in radio silence here? Now, some of the people in the crowd may not have been language scholars because they thought he was putting in a call to the prophet Elijah. One of the people made a beeline for a sponge and a stick and they soaked up some sour wine and hoisted it up to the J-Man. But the other people said, wait, wait, we want to see if Elijah's going to make an appearance. Anyway, none of that mattered because the big J shouted again at the top of his lungs and then ejected his spiritual essence. Concurrently, some major mojo shifted on earth because over at the church house, the drapes ripped clean in half and there was also measurable seismic activity, enough to break a few boulders. It's possible some of those boulders were gravestones, because a bunch of tombs popped open and their inhabitants, believers who were heretofore dead, came waltzing out and paraded around the city for a bunch of people to marvel at, or get freaked out about, depending on how you react to that sort of thing. But not yet, because it says they came out after the J-Man's resuscitation, which hasn't happened yet. So... While the timeline may seem a tad out of order here, meanwhile, we know that the Roman troops in the military hoo-ha in charge of them felt the earth move under their feet and saw all the other stuff and got a little creeped out. They said, come to think of it, this guy really was the male offspring of Yahweh. During this whole thing, Jesus had an audience of women a little ways off who were part of a support crew that had shadowed him all the way from Galilee. Top billing in that squad went to a couple of Marys, one of whom was the mysterious Magdalene. Another was the mother of Zebedee's kids. You know, the one she tried to get front row seats in heaven for back in chapter 20. So at the end of the day, a really affluent guy from Arimathea, who was a big fan of Jesus, named Joe, dropped by Pilate's place to ask if he could have the corpse. Pilate said, sure. So Joe of Arimathea bundled up the J-man in some nice fabric and put him in a grave that he had chiseled out for himself and wheeled a big rock in front of the door. Then he split. But the two Marys, Magdalene and the other one, they plopped down next to the rock and stayed put. Tomorrow comes and all the top religious hoo-ha stopped by Pilate's pad to chat him up again. They said, dude, as we recall, that liar, back when he was alive, claimed he was going to stand back up after the Sabbath. 
Do us a flavor and seal up that tomb until then, so that the ridiculous Jesus boys can't show up after hours and exhume the guy and then pull a weekend at Bernie's, because then we'd have an even bigger problem than before. So Pilate said, yeah, have a few guards and go mortar it up to your heart's content. So they did. They sealed the place up, posted a sentry, and they figured that was that. Next in this series, we'll move on to chapter 28. Spoiler alert, I don't want to ruin it for you, but that was not that. If the Bible and Hollywood have taught us anything, it's that if there's an expensive cliffhanger, there's always a big budget sequel. As always, I'm not a religious figure, but if you want me to save you or damn you to hell, I'll do my best. <laughs>